Thank you so much, and we go with the last session that it's about accelerating and modernizing application development with OpenShift Developer Console, the ODC and ODO. Jai and Pali. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm very excited and nervous about this talk. Uh, all right. So, in this talk, we are going to talk about how you can accelerate and modernize your application development with OpenShift Developer Console and ODO. It's mouthful, I know, but we couldn't help it. Uh, so my name is Parthvi, and I work as a software engineer uh, for Red Hat, specifically Red Hat Developer Tools. Um, so I'm one of the developers for Odo. What Odo is, we'll talk in a bit. I have a background in quality engineering, worked on pro uh, products such as Red Hat Cloud Forms and Red Hat Insight. I have huge fondness for dogs. I have a big soft spot for them. I have a beautiful six-year-old Labrador. We can talk about it if you want. Um, I would like my co-speaker to introduce himself and tell you a bit about the agenda for this talk. So over to you, Jay. So, hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here in front of you all and talk about the, uh, how we're going to accelerate or provide uh, enhanced life experience for a developer. So brief about me. My name is Jay, and I'm part of Red Hat. I'm working as an engineering manager in OpenShift Development Console. And I contribute to projects like OpenShift Console, OpenShift Dev Console, and my area of interest lies around anything related to web, UI, or Kubernetes. That was brief about me. And in today's agenda, we are going to talk about the developer workflow, the pain which they go through, and the toolings and the products which we have to enhance their experience, like Odo, OpenShift Console, and OpenShift Developer Console. Now let's see what's our mission. So our mission is basically developer productivity, and we look for the challenges the developer face and how to overcome them. We provide them a solution. So in next subsequent slides, we'll be talking through it and trying to show you demos how we are going to achieve that. So with that, I'll pass to Patri. When we talk about developer workflow, we mainly talk about two things. The first one being in a loop, second one being out a loop. You'll hear these terms a lot today, so please bear with us. When we say in a loop, it is the initial phase of your application development lifecycle when you are continuously coding, building, and testing your application locally until you are satisfied with it and want to share it with your team for them to review. Um, I hope that was clear. Uh, so next is outer loop development cycle, which happens at a larger team level, where your code is going through a review, where you are in, uh, doing integration testing, security and compliance is checked, until you're ready to move to production and release your application. Uh, Odo is targeted towards your inner loop development cycle, while OpenShift Developer Console, which Jay is going to talk about, is focused on the outer loop development cycle. So let's talk, oh, sorry. So Red Hat does provide a wide variety of tools for both your inner loop and outer loop. You can take a look at that. The image is not updated, but uh, we couldn't fit all the products in one page. What is Odo? The name is a bit weird. I don't know, I find it weird. Um, but Odo is a very simple CLI tool for application developers who want to work closely with a cloud native environment, maybe it's OpenShift or Kubernetes or whatnot, but find it difficult to do so because of the complexities and steep learning curve involved in running your application on the cluster. Um, so let's take an example of this application developer who wants to run their application on OpenShift cluster. Now you might ask, why does he want to do that? Why, sorry, why do they want to do that? Why can't they just do it locally? But this application, once it is ready for production, will be deployed on maybe OpenShift or Kubernetes or the likewise cloud native environments. And so our application, would, application developer would like to run their in a loop in a production-like environment. Um, so this image, it shows, it gives you a brief idea about the complexities involved. Uh, you need to know about deployment, services, persons and volumes, and whatnot to run your application on the cluster. Odo can uh, help abstract these complexities. Next slide. So with the help of Odo and dev file, this application developer can run their application on OpenShift or Kubernetes, or likewise, with two or three simple commands. Uh, since this is a Dev Nation day, I'm going to use OpenShift 
uh, but you can also, you know, uh, so how am I doing so far? All good? I haven't gone blank, which is a good sign. Um, cool. <laughs> so I am going to use a very simple Hello World application. I know people don't like it, but you know, it's simple. It, it works. This works. Um, so it is a very simple Go project, and I would like to run this project on OpenShift cluster. Uh, so if anyone wants to do a live demo, if someone is like me and wants to uh, do these things with me, you can check out um, the GitHub link, this repository. Um, sorry. You can try this out. You can clone it locally and follow it with me. And Odo, since it's a CLI tool, it is supported for all the standard operating systems. Uh, we have Linux, Mac OS, Windows, so it's a very simple command. You can just uh, install it and run. For my case, I've already installed Odo. Let's quickly check its version. It's v3. We recently went GA with that, which is why I'm talking about it here. Uh, so let's take a look at our main.go, which is the only file that we have. I hope people are comfortable with Go. If not, I can just walk you through it. Um, so we have our application has two simple endpoints. The first one is this. It's a ping. Uh, when you call it, it gives a response in Pong. The other one is connect, but we'll talk about it in a bit. Um, now, I mentioned before that Odo uses dev file. Now, what is dev file? Dev file, uh, so nowadays we're defining everything as code. You have infrastructure as code. You have CI, CD as code. So why not your development environment as a code? Dev file will help you define your development environment as a code. And Odo uses dev file to understand the resources it should create for you and the commands it should run on those resources to run your application on a cluster. Um, so currently, we do not have a dev file. Uh, and we will use odo to fetch a dev file for us. The command is odo init. So when you do odo init, it will analyze your source code and determine the best suitable dev file for you. In this case, it is go, which is correct. And it will fetch it from the default dev file registry. So dev file registry is something like image registry. If you've used Docker Hub or key.io or, uh, you know, the kinds. Dev file registry is similar to that. It's just that it supports a lot of different languages, and you will find dev file for it there. Um, all right. So it has a single component here, uh, which is all right. And it exports port 8080, which is what we need. So we'll just hit configuration is correct. I'm going to use the default uh, name that it's uh, detected. And we see that we now have a dev file. So let's quickly take a look at it. Now, there are two important things that I would like uh, for you to look at. The first one is components. Components defines the resources that should be created. Now, we're going to work inside a cloud native environment, which means our application will essentially run inside a container, and which is why we have defined a container component here. It uses this image that is provided by DevFile. Uh, it exposes this endpoint, which we saw earlier. You can define memory limits and the likes. And then I said that you can also, uh, Odo also uses dev file to know the commands it should run to run your application. So here we have, a, we have two simple commands. We have build command, which will build our main.go file. And we have the run command, which will run the binary for us. There are also information such as metadata, which essentially tells you more about dev file. And there is schema version and starter project, but we don't need to bother with that right now. Um, so we have dev file. We should be ready to uh, you know, run our application on the cluster. But there are two things we need to do first. Um, sorry. The first thing is we need to log in to our OpenShift cluster. So if you have Minikube locally, you can just use Minikube. You don't need to log in. You can skip this step. But since I'm on OpenShift, I would need to log in. The second step is that we need to define a namespace where all of our resources will be created. So um, all the resources will be confined to this particular namespace. For this, we'll use Odo create namespace. Let's say DNDI Odo. All right. Uh, we see that Odo created it, and it is now ready for use. 
So next, we have dev file, we have our project. I'm simply going to hit order dev. So this will first create all the necessary Kubernetes resources. Uh, like I said, Odo abstracts all the complexities. Uh, so if you were listening to Praveen talk, he mentioned that uh, there, uh, he deployed his application using uh, manifest. He has this huge manifest file with Kubernetes resources. But with Odo, Odo takes care of creating those resources for you. So all you can do is focus on your code. Now, once it creates the resources, it will sync the files from your local system to the container and it will build the image. So we took a look at the build command in our dev file and the run command. So it uh, runs those commands in that order and port forwards our application to our local host. So I don't need ingresses or routes or you know things like that. I can simply curl this uh, URL and it's a spong, which is fine. Now, I want to extend my application to, you know, maybe uh, print a custom hello world message. For this, I will modify my main.go file. So if you see Odo detected changes in the main.go file and it is now uh, syncing the file changes again to your cluster. <coughs> Sorry, give me a second. Odo dev, it continuously watches your project directory for any changes that you might make. In this case, I made change to main.go. So it detected those changes. It made sure that my resources were running. It uh, synced the file changes to the container and rebuilt the application. So now, if I hit the same curl command again with my name, it says hello par 3, which is perfect. It's working as expected. Now, moving on to the second part of our uh, demo, I mentioned about this other uh, API endpoint, which was connect. So this essentially, what it does is it pings the MongoDB server and makes sure that it can connect to it. Um, we have this whole function here. We don't need to bother with that right now. It, uh, I've defined username, password, and host. So uh, this application, it obtains these information from the environment variables. Uh, right now, if I was to curl this command, let's see what we get. It says that it failed to connect to the server because it did not find username, which is fine, because we haven't connected to a database. Now, since we're working in a cloud native environment, uh, my database is deployed as a microservice. I'm assuming that your you know, DevOps people would provide you with the environment, so you don't need to bother with creating these services. In my case, I've already created the service. Um, so now what I need to do is connect my application to the service for which I would use the odo add binding command. Uh, now, my service is not in this namespace, is what I know. It's in all accessible namespace. It is in Perkona namespace, so we go to that. MongoDB instance is the service that I want to connect to. So I hit MongoDB, uh, I hit yes. We'll use the default binding name. Now, I mentioned before that our application relies on environment variables to get information such as username, password, and host. So we'll bind this information as environment variable. We'll use the default naming strategy. Uh, and as soon as we do this, uh, we see that Odo detected changes in the dev file.yaml and it created something called service binding. So Odo uses this operator called service binding operator to bind your application to, uh, you know, it could be another application or it could be a microservice. Currently, Odo only supports connecting to a few microservices out of the box, but um, there are workarounds that you could do. So it created service binding resource, um, and it will then recreate the pod and resync our changes and uh, rerun our application. Let's wait for it to work. Okay. So our application is now ready. And if we hit the curl command again, it says that you have successfully pinged the server. Uh, now I'm satisfied with this. I don't want to go or take any more time. So I'm just going to hit control C on my order dev and let it delete the resources that I had created. I'm now ready to move on to my outer loop, which is where I'm going to hand it over to Jay. Um, but yeah, I think that brings in to my demo. Now, uh, if you want to know more about Odo, 
we have codeo.dev website, you can visit it. We have uh, quite a few quick start guides. So it doesn't matter what framework you're using, or if you, uh, if you modify your dev file correctly, or, uh, you know, Oro will help you run your inner loop. Um, so this is, we have quick start guides uh, for these for now. And without, all right, so uh, we saw that Oro is a CLI tool, but if you wanted to run this thing directly from your IDE, let's say VS Code or IntelliJ, we have OpenShift Toolkit. Uh, it's a plugin, uh, plugin which you can install, uh, which essentially uses Odo. We have a talk coming up, Mohit Suman, in some time. Um, and if you would like to get in touch with us, we are on kubernetes.slack.com at Odo. And it's an open source project, so feel free to try it out and uh, you know contribute to it if uh, you wish. I'll hand it over to Jay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Patavi. I hope I'm audible. So uh, that was great. In last few sessions, we have seen how from YAML we came to Odo CLI, and with few clicks or few basically terminal options, we can easily code and build and test our application. Next, we'll be seeing OpenShift Console. So I think in all of the sessions, pretty much people have used Console in some form to show you guys. So I'm not sure how many of you have actually used it. Can we get a quick hands on how many of you have used OpenShift Console or basically aware of it? I know, I mean, basically in OpenShift for Kubernetes, you need to lot of, know a lot of things. Those things have become easier with Odo. But what if I tell you with few clicks, you can create or deploy your application and make it cloud native up and running in few minutes. So before going that, let me take a brief step back and talk about OpenShift Console. OpenShift Console is primarily uh, interface through which any user can interact with it. And we have two different perspectives in OpenShift Console. So I will not be taking you through the other slides uh, because I know it's pretty much around lunch time and you guys would be feeling hungry or sleepy. So we'll stick to the demos. So there are two perspectives. One is administrator and another one is developer. So why do we have two perspectives? Basically, admin perspective is focused more on the guys from the infrastructure of operation sites who are more worried or wanted to have information about the cluster. So in this particular screen, what we call overview, you can see the cluster health overall cluster status at a glance, the activity happening around it, along with the usage about the cluster utilization. There are a lot of this information available to you. And cluster admin can do a lot more than that. There is option for administrator again, where you can check cluster settings. You can take a look at the upgrade part, do the upgrade as needed. As you can see in this particular screen, uh, this cluster is in 0.10.36. And we have two paths to choose from. So, uh, admin can also uh, take control of the compute, be it like nodes or machine states, whatever they want to do in this particular cluster. And we also have ability to add resource quotas that's more like restricting namespaces depending on utilization if you want to do that. And apart from that, one thing I would like to highlight now itself is like about operators. With opposite 4.x, operator hub is a place where which you can install a lot of things. It provides a lot of uh, operators out there which can plug into the cluster and enhance the overall experience or try to achieve something which, uh, I mean, which you would like to do. So in this particular cluster, you can see there are a lot of operators, but few I have already installed here for this demo, which are listed over here. I would like to highlight few which I'll be talking through this session. One is like OpenShift uh, serverless, OpenShift pipelines, web terminal, etc. So that was about admin perspective or administrator. Now let me go back to uh, dev perspective. So in developer perspective, uh, we have uh, basically a dedicated section which is tailored just for developers or keeping them in mind, whatever they do during their day-to-day -day work. So be it like uh, if you have your repo uh, code pushed into GitLab, Bitbucket, or GitHub, you want to quickly deploy it. Or if you have an image somewhere, you want to quickly try it out. Or if you are working on Java-based system, and if you have even JAR as well along with you for Quarkus or Spring Boot, you can usually do upload the jar and with a click you can uh, make it cloud native basically. So in this section you can see there are a lot of options like import from git which I spoke about, container image and then we have upload jar file and even import YAML if you like YAML a lot. And it's not just that, some cards if you're seeing is shown for eventing here. So these are being shown because I have installed OpenShift serverless operator into it. Which I'll go into it a bit later. So let me quickly go to uh, import from git and try to show you something. So 
if you select any of these options here like uh, say Ruby. So what I have done till now is just provided the GitHub URL and it has detected the runtime for me. So we have pretty much a lot of runtimes which will cover everything. This is for S2I flow. We even have Docker fly, uh, Docker file or dev file flow. Depending on what your repo contains, you can use that. So in this particular example, it was Ruby, so it detected Ruby. Let me change it and use something for Node.js. So I'll use a Node.js app now. Basically, build time is Node. It has been detected already. And this is basically a Node.js game as the name says, is built on CSS. So let me try to go you and show other options. So everything is pre-populated for you. I don't think you need to make any click or change anything. I'll just try to remove the application name. It's not needed, but if you would like to. And then we have resources where user is shown with three types of resources here. One is deployment and deployment config and serverless deployment. User can choose whatever they want to. If you want to go with a default, deployment is the thing. And next I would like to go ahead and show you the advanced options. There are a lot of things you can configure if you would like to do, like health checks over there, build configuration, scaling, resource limits, etc. But I'm not doing anything. All I want to show you with basically two clicks you can deploy your application. So the first one was while providing the GitHub repo. And next I'm going to do now, create. So this will take me to a view which we call topology. So I would like to hi highlight about topology view as well. So topology view is more like a one single spot for developers where they can take a look at all the applications which they have in their namespace. They can see the relationship between them. They can see the resources it creates, a lot of other options. So as you can see here, uh, currently uh, the Node.js game is being deployed and build is running. If I click on it, you will see the status, you can check the logs, and behind the scenes, it has created already a bunch of resources for you, like build config, services, routes, and in turn, creating for you pods and up as well, or image stream as well. So now, it, you see, it is coming up, pods are getting created. So that's the power of, or basically, how easy it makes for an end user to deploy their application. So the application is pretty much up, and let me go back to the ad flow again. Uh, to show you one more thing, that is about uh, developer catalog. So it's not just the list being shown over here. We have a full-fledged catalog over here, where you can go and select different options depending on what you want to achieve. It even has a dev file, which part we spoke about, if you want to try out a dev file directly. So that was about the catalog. Now let me go back and try out something with container image quickly. So I will use uh, Invincible J Scramola. This is one of the image which I have. So just you need to provide your image. If it's public one, it will be validated automatically. If it's private one, you need to provide the credentials. And next is, again, everything is pre-populated. I will not make any changes again here. And I'll try to select serverless, serverless deployment now. So what is serverless deployment? Let me talk about that for a bit. So I've installed OpenSource serverless operator into the cluster. That is the reason you are able to see the third option into the resource section. So serverless is based on upstream project called Knative, and it has two primary components. One is serving, and another one is eventing. So what I'm showing you guys now is serving. So serverless deployment, if I select and press create, it will try to create a Knative service for me, which we call it serverless deployment. The benefit here is it can scale to zero depending on the configuration what has been provided. So suppose if there are no traffic being uh, received, they will be scaled to zero. So in this particular view, you also see uh, two similar rectangle boxes. These are again serverless deployments, which I have created prior to this session. So you see it's called auto scale to zero, because there are no traffic being received by these services. And Scramola is as well up, and my Node.js game is as well up. Let me try to click on the route and see if it's working fine. So game is there, it's ready to play it, but I will not do it right away. I'll go back to my slide again. And this is Scramola. So the Scramola is basically a simple game, uh, not a game, basically a story pointing poker thing where you can provide your name and join the game. You can give your name, you can select the game name, say sprint number, whatever, join as creator or as a player. And you can start the game, add stories, and a lot of things you can do achieve over there. So let me go back to the UI again. So that was about container image flow and uh, import from get. I wanted to quickly show you one more thing, which I really like, uh, uh, upload from jar. So you can click on this and go to the view, or if you are in topology view, I'll just try to scroll it, uh, minimize it. So I have one Vercus app over here. If I select and drop over here, as you can see, 
the whole area is being highlighted now. And user will be taken to the form, no need to fill anything. It's one DND. I will go with default things. You can keep application name as well, and I will say create. But you can again change and configure anything or override things if you need to. So I'll be doing create now. So, so now the jar is being deployed, and if you click on the status, you can see some the information as I saw before. So now let me try to go back to Scramola again at the Kinetic service. And I would like to talk about traffic splitting. So basically, it's not just that uh, what is being deployed. You see, in the right side, there are revisions. We can have multiple revisions, and we can split the traffic among those revisions. So how to achieve that? This time, I'll be editing my application. So with one click, you're back to the source, how you created it. And this time, I'll go to scaling options, and I'll say min pod as one, and max as three. And I'll do save. So in the project view, you can see again, a new revision has come up, and the old pods are getting terminated. And there's an the option for set traffic distribution, which I'd like to show you now. It opens the model, you can say, depending on your interest, what traffic you want to be received by each of the revisions. I'll say 50% for uh, O2 and say 40% for O1. And I'll do save. Boom. We have our distribution being shown into the UI as well. You can try it out later. I will tell you the link how to quickly check it out. So that was about serving. Now let me go to the next component, cost serverless, that is eventing. So basically, eventing, we have uh, different things based on basically cloud events. So there is a way where, with which you can subscribe to cloud events. There are different things like channels or brokers, depending on the usage. I'm not going into detail of those, as there is a session from Mohit post lunch, which you can join. And for now, I'll be trying to create something. Let me create a channel. So there are different kinds of channels. Currently, I have in-memory uh, present over here. I'll just select in-memory and say create. So channel is visualized like this. And as you can see, there are no event sources or subscriber. Let me create an event source. If I go to event sources, you can see a bunch of event sources over there. There are many from uh, Apache. You can subscribe. You can create any of these sources, be it from Telegram, AWS Kansas, or Slack, etc. So I will stick to uh, thing source for now, just to show you, demonstrate you something. I'll do a create thing source. I can provide devnation as my data. And schedule, I'll go with for second. And in the input target, I'll select uh, the channel which I just created. So no further changes. And you can also go to YAML view if you would like to see. Uh, but that's fine for now. I'll go ahead and do a create. So as you can see, uh, there's a connection between my source and channel. But still, channel doesn't have any subscription. Let me try to subscribe this channel to some of the services. So what I'll be doing for now, there are two event display services. So basically a simple service which locks the cloud event which it receives. So I'll do a drag and drop on the first service. It creates a model for me. Just do a click. Again, drag and drop to other service and do a click. The connections are being formed. So we have our setup ready. Cloud events are being emitted through the event source, goes to the channel, and then to the services. So as you can see, the still auto scale to zero. So in a while, you will be seeing events coming in, and the logger will be printing that event, definition in this case, which I have provided. So uh, let it, uh, it will take some time. So meanwhile, I know many of you will be missing uh, even uh, terminal, right? I mean, you like terminal so much, you would like to try a lot of things over there. So if we have inbuilt terminal, which is powered by web terminal operator again into the open source web console. And if you click on this particular icon, you will see that. So this is very useful Useful if you want to do something serious or want to make some changes, or you are in some devices which doesn't have terminal, like tablet or something like that. You can make use of this. And it has a lot of tools already installed for you, the CLI. If you can take a look, it's there. You can also make it full stream if you would like to, or maximize it. So, great. I'll go back to the demo now and I'll close the terminal. Yes. And as you can see, the pods are up. If I click on the service in the pod logs, you can see the events being emitted here. So that was about the serverless. 
Next thing which I would like to talk about is open source pipelines. So we have seen the S2I flow initially, which I showed you guys. So open source pipelines is based on Tecton, which is our stream project again. Uh, let me go to import from get quickly, and this time I'll deploy a GoLang app. So I'll select deployment, and there's an the option to add pipelines. So pipelines is basically uh, basically different tasks work together which forms a pipeline. So this is the pipeline definition which you are seeing, and once we create uh, hit create, it will create or invoke that pipelines for us and do the fetch, build, and deploy. So currently build is in progress. Some tasks are running and some are in pending state. If you want to take a closer look, you can go to the pipelines tab and just click on pipeline runs, and it shows you the current status along with the logs for it. So that was about the uh, OpenShift serverless and pipelines, which I need to cover. And now next is, okay, great. We have built so many workloads. Uh, how to observe it or how to basically monitor it or how to track it? In the console, we also have a section dedicated for observability. If you click on that, it preloads with some of the dashboards. I will select bots for now. And as you can see, it is showing me the CPU utilization, CPU quota, etc. You can even go to metrics tab and try to customize or use any query from queries if you want to play with or tweak anything and try to get the information what you need. So that was about uh, the monitoring sections and these sections are available in admin as well. If any of the administrator wants to take a look, they can take a look at a glance at across all namespaces. So this is what I wanted to talk about pretty much. And next thing which I'd like to show about, if you guys are missing basically dark theme, we also have user preferences section where you can select the language of your choice perspective of your choice which you want to land to or you can select dark theme and oh. so we have a lot of things to offer over here I'll go back to slide I know we are during the near the lunch time now so these slides pretty much I covered during my presentation so I'll just do a quick recap we spoke about the admin and dev perspective we saw what ODC is or open source dev console and the benefit it provides to the end users then we discussed about the topology view which provides a lot of information at a glance to the user and we discussed about web terminal, open source serverless, both the components which it provides like serving and eventing. And then we discussed about the pipelines and how easy it is to invoke a pipelines with open source web control. And we discussed how to monitor or track your application. So it's not just that it, we have a lot of other things like quick start, direct tools, sample applications, GitOps authentication, managed services, and many, many more. So I would highly encourage you guys to try it out if you want now, you can click, go to Red Hat Developer Sandbox. It's free, just you can click on it and start using it or exploring open source console and dev console together. So that was our time. Thanks again, everyone, for being here. It was really nice talking to you all. And thank you for listening to us. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much.